zoning uh, ordinance um, discussion right off the bat, uh, before public comment and before um, uh, reporting that. So, uh, here, I've got a handout. If anybody, this is what was. And I'm actually going to hand over the conversation to Ryan, Ryan O'Donnell, because this is the one that brought it up. Okay. And I don't feel qualified to talk on it. Um, I barely feel qualified. Councilor Ryan O'Donnell. Okay. Yes. Well, well, thank you. Thank you for your, your time. And um, thank you, Councilor Dwight, for uh, making the recommendation that this be brought to you. I think it's a really good idea. And some of the conversation um, our comments on the zoning ordinance that we had by email has already been very productive. So um, I look forward to your comments today. Basically, uh, as you may know, we're looking at um, a part of the zoning code. Um, the zoning code is vast, and we're only looking at a very small section of it, uh, the section that sets rules for when you build projects that are over seven, you know, seven units or more. Um, and when you do that, you need to get a special permit for those projects. And some of the uh, requirements you have to meet in that case have to do with streets and building articulation and affordable housing and so on. Uh, but there are also requirements and standards about energy, um, standards for when you, when you do the building. And so my purpose is to consult with you. Um, I think there's a lot of expertise in this commission and um, you all have a copy in front of you. I would just really like your opinion about um, the section, I forgot what letter it is, it's, I think it's probably the second page, um, that says environment and energy. Uh, I'd really like your opinion about the, uh, the, the two standards that a builder could meet, they have an option um, of either a uh, home energy rating system um, amount um, or uh, a certain U.S. Green Building Council lead um, standard. Um, I think the balance here is we have to be as um, ambitious as we can on environmental and energy standards, but also make sure that we're not going too far because we want affordability is also a goal. Uh, we want affordable housing to be built in the city of Northampton and we also want to meet energy standards and environmentalists. So um, I'm happy to explain it further if I haven't been clear, but mostly I just wanted to open it up and get your thoughts and opinions and guidance. Can I just add a couple of comments? Okay. Please, sir. One is, um, so this is about URC and URB districts, are the two zoning districts that are sort of the donut around downtown um, and around Florence. So it wouldn't affect Central Business District, wouldn't affect State Hospitals. Um, and just so you know, sort of the intention of the, the her rating system, what we were looking for was a number that was low enough that it was a reach for a developer, but we know developers can do it um, without PV because not all sites work for PV, and it might be easier if they did. So Louis Hasbrook looked at, you know, where were new buildings coming in, the state hospital where they're all pretty low, and then elsewhere as well since the energy stretch code is coming. And this this actually the suggestion is twenty five percent lower than the uh, stretch code or, or the HERS system. Uh, I suppose HERS system is redundant, like saying pin number. Mm -hmm. The uh, um, <laughs> the but the so that it's attached as as the stretch code as the state modifies and changes or the city changes and modifies the stretch code. We originally had a number, and I can't remember was that. 40? It was forty one originally, and then somewhere in the process it got amended to the percent for exactly that reason. The amendment this committee I can't remember where it happened. An idea being exactly as you right. say, and I think they made a point of we don't know what the next generation of stretch right. code is going to be. It, it, the and as Ryan said in those discussions, there was there was one builder in particular, when we all, but for most of us know, uh, who said this was unachievable or unsustainable. That that builders couldn't um, couldn't make a reasonable profit on their on their work if we went this stringent. Um, and I don't know the answer to that. Ryan didn't know the answer to that. So the idea was to appeal. The people who do know the answer to that, which is why we do know that a lot of buildings are coming in to meet this piece. Um, certainly, state hospital, almost all the buildings there. Would qualify. 
But and, and sure. but to Ryan's point. point about affordability, um, I think Walker's point was that you cannot. He could, although the the criteria for affordability by at this point is ten percent of of the development would would provide um, affordable systems or rounding up. If it's seven units, then one unit will be affordable. So, if you build affordable units and if you build them without cross subsidies, that is, you're getting grants. The affordability is probably not the challenging units because they're going to get tax credits. They're going to get something different. Who's going to pay extra piece? It's the how do you get market rate units that are affordable? Mm -hmm. And is this an impediment to that? It adds cost. There's no question yeah. it's cost. And, and it all comes. You know, Louis talked about when he built his house and he projected. You know, what would electricity or what would what energy prices be? And it's all, what do you put in that equation? Do you think energy prices are gonna go up? You know, there's more and more just for banks for these mortgages that, that look at what your energy costs will be. I mean, I guess, you know, if we really believe that our goal is to get a 20% reduction by 2020 and whatever the, whatever it is to get down, we eventually need to get the net zero building. So I think we, just, we need to be aggressive for doing it. But there's no question state hospital units are more expensive than buildings that look equally nice on the outside in every single way. That's, that's one of the costs. And, and by how much? That I don't know. I mean, by large amount, small amount, and I mean, or like, does it price people out, or is it a difference of a couple of a thousand dollars that might not price someone out? I don't know if this is a package, because it's, you know, it's hard. I, like, you know, I, I built a house there, so I know what my house costs, right. and I did both lead gold and have a hearse rating of 29, but I don't know what you know, what, where, where my costs went, was the overall package. I can make, give some comments on that. Well, I mean, <clears throat> um, currently code requires 65 um, for a 3,000 square foot uh, building or larger, and then her 70 or lower for a smaller building. And um, as I mentioned in my emails, I think I made it to not everyone here, but to the, guys, um, the average home in Northampton, I think, was 55 in 2013. Um, and, you know, the difference between 70 and 55 isn't huge. You know, and I don't, I think, as I mentioned in my email, really has to do with design, not so much added fancy insulation. Um, so costs, I think, at that level aren't, you know, isn't an argument to say, you know, this is going to jack up costs a lot. I'm talking about hers 41, you know, that's that's a big jump, and I am concerned with that number for around downtown, just because, you know, they're going to have uh, mid to upper market buildings only, and that's, you know, that's going to be tough. And, and, and Ryan, uh, and I think for the public record and then for my edification as well, and possibly help Ryan, the difference between hers and LEED, the criteria um, for rating is different. And uh, can you explain the yeah. differences? That yeah, it's really different. So hers index is scale 0 to 100, where 0 is a zero net energy home, and 100 is a home built to the 2006 base energy code. Um, now the 2009 code that we use here in Northampton and all stretch code communities use are those standards I, standards that I just mentioned. So her 70 and her 65. The 2015 code that's actually being presented to Massachusetts in the next couple months, with expected to be adopted in a year or a year and a half, mm -hmm. is going to be have a performance path option of her 55. Mm -hmm. So the base code option will be her 55, and that's going to be a huge jump over where things are now. And builders are going to be up in arms about that. It's going to be tough. But that's where we're going. So, okay. you know, we don't know where the stretch code will be on top of that. So um, if we, we, we do an additional 25% on the proposed state uh, recommended levels, that's significant. Yeah. That's yeah. And that does get us down to near, near 41. Right? Yeah, and, and in two years, that's where, you know, yeah, that's where things will be. And we're talking statewide. Um, so that's probably not a huge jump in a couple of years. But it's all about the context, right? So right now, how are you comparing the cost of building to other things right now that are reaching her 70? That's a big jump. Mm -hmm. And remember, this is, you know, people have a base density in this area. So we're saying we want more to build at these, at these greater units. I mean, someone doesn't have to do this kind of project. And so there are some, some economies of scale. I think, for some of this, this is just for multifamily? Is this just for multifamily? But this is for a project that contains more than one unit. Right. Okay. Well, no, seven, 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 seven units. Oh, excuse me. But they could be seven oh. single family homes. Right. Oh, one one in the okay. Okay. Right. So where, where are we in the process? Uh, 
going to present that. Right, that's a good question. question. Where are we in the process as far as the revisions to URC? Yeah, thank you. And it also applies to URB. Uh, um, so where we are in the process is uh, the ordinance committee is, is currently scheduled to meet um, next Monday, the 22nd. And at that meeting, they possibly could vote to advance them to the full city council. Um, it's possible they're, it, it may be put off a little bit, but the moratorium that we put on um, all of this ends on December 31st currently. So we're trying to get this um, into the stages where it's close to being done. Um, but I, I will say that, you know, I, I, I had kind of a, a related meeting with the housing partnership um, the night before last, and I asked a similar question about the affordable housing section of this, and they expressed the need for a little bit more time to get those numbers right. Um, and so, you know, I, I say that to make the point that we want, we do want to get this right, and we might take a little bit more time, but 20 seconds. I was asking where the process was at because I'm thinking off the top of my head, either Louie through the Building Commissioners Associations. Um, I mean, they, there must be information out there on what they're seeing as far as increasing costs mm -hmm. when you start going through these different levels. And I'm also thinking the Home Builders Associations, I'm sure they're tracking this to see, and the Realtors Associations. Okay. So I'm sure the information is out there as more and more communities are, have adopted the stretch code, and now we're talking about you know, increasing the HERS ratings. It's just getting that information. Okay. So Louis was involved in the process and sort of did it backwards. So I don't think he could tell you exactly the dollar amounts were, but he was sort of seeing where were these projects coming in, sort of weighing okay. he was talking about the numbers. And sort of what seemed like it wasn't really a stretch for builders based on what they experienced. I think the average was 55 in 2013. Mm -hmm. Just doing, you know, they didn't have to be that low. They could be 70 and still pass. Right. And so because hers is an energy modeling, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs. You can do things and that don't cost more and still get there. You can have two less windows and get closer. You can have an energy star fridge and get closer. So there's all these, it's a kind of complex. My, uh, my wife and I are, are developing a piece of land. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And I was given instructions by our, given information by our architect choice that to do a leads, it's gonna cost me $40,000 or better to, to do leads. And I'm wondering, I don't know if that means that regardless of what the project is, it's gonna cost $40,000 or if it's the size of my project that makes it cost that much. But nevertheless, I would think that if you were building seven units or more, you had to divide that 40,000 by the mm -hmm. number of units or is it 40,000 per unit? Mm -hmm. You know, that could make a big difference and it would drive the price up. Uh, if you're selling them, or it will drive the rent up. Mm -hmm. so, rental. so that's the reason to sort of give people a choice, because I've heard some Versus developers say, money. well, I think I've heard it both ways. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I know for our house, we are hearing in a three or four thousand is what the cost of okay. what, again, we weren't doing, except for bathroom fan, we didn't do anything in our house to get the rating, so we were doing what we wanted to do anyway. <laughs> and the bathroom fan was that last point to get us from silver and gold. <laughs> so the only cost was an actual, actual registration cost was a uh -huh. third party. Mm. I'm sorry. So, that's so a, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, right off the bat, uh, since this is almost effectively um, stated a new building code, um, uh, I mean, Northampton wanted to do wanted to have a higher energy efficiency code <coughs> a long time ago, but we were led to believe that you can't. We can't do a building code. So the reason we can do this is we're giving extra density to a developer and we're giving them a choice. Okay. So that's part of the reason for the ORs, they get a choice for how they do it, and then because it's an extra okay. density. I just wanted to make sure that was being considered. So this was, this special, was an avenue that we could. It's use. special permit criteria, so that's, that's a different animal than making generic yeah. code. Okay, so. pretty good. And then the, um, <clears throat> the second thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, towards what Aiden is saying is that when the, the stretch code right now is, is kind of behind. It's the old stretch code, even though it's paired up with the new building code. And the building code is actually possibly even better than the stretch code at, the, at this moment. Um, uh, there's no guarantee, but what I've been hearing from the Department of Energy Resources, it's not their call, but that they have a lot of say into it. Um, they, uh, you, the, the building code is, follows the, the, the national building code every three years. Right, have I got that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. So they don't want to, what, 
the DOER is looking at is that they don't want to have to update the stretch code every three years. Mm -hmm. They think that just gets to be very disruptive. And so um, the next time that what they're pushing for is that they push it out to what they expect to see in six years. So if they if they do go that way, and it's not the OER that will do that, but but so they don't you know they don't have say over it, but they are pushing for that. Um, then the, the jump to the next stretch code could be quite significant. Um, so just take that into account. And if you attach you know a further percentage below that, um, then you really don't know how low you're going to be pushing. You have kind of wild swings back right. and forth. So right. that would be in 2021. You would yeah. expect. You, you expect the new one in 2015 and then possibly six years after that? Um, if they choose yeah, to the new one's probably going to, you know, it's probably going to come out in 2015. I mean, they're working on it right now, so <clears throat> I haven't heard that it's getting close. So there's two approaches. You could just go back to the just using the HERS number, or you could just figure all these things are living documents and we'd have to go back to counts. Right, right, right exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to throw in a third one too, is <clears throat> if you felt comfortable enough with coming up with specific numbers, say, 20% not to go below a certain hers rating or something like that. So that, you know, you could basically set yourself up so that if they push it really far, then you just get to your, your mark. Um, where not where you're really required thinking. below. We don't object if someone wants to do that. Below. Right, exactly, right. Well, remember, if they push it really far, that's gonna be code in Northampton, as long as the stretch code is still around. So then you're, you know, your risk setting situation where the special permit, you actually need a house worse than Outside of it, right? You don't want to do that. You would have to. I, I think it should be yes. codified right. and implicitly understood that it should not go below the, the standard that Northampton's already established in its building. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. And one thing I mentioned in my email: the stretch code yeah. could go away. That's another thing right. that might happen. Um, so mm -hmm. another option is having another sure. sentence there that says aligning it with the base code performance path option. Every every right. energy code now is going to have a performance path option, which is just a HERS rating option. So instead of going through the prescriptive list, you need these kinds of windows, this installation here, here, et cetera, et cetera, you can just do a HERS rating, which is energy modeling performance based approach. So that's an option. So right now in non stretch code towns, builders can do that and they have to hit uh, HERS 60. Uh, uh, just for my clarification, is that is is that different from what um, Chris said in terms of setting up? Uh, uh, a number um, in the code? I mean, is that what you're kind of suggesting? Yeah, it's different than a specific number because as okay. the energy code in the next 20 years gets more stringent, you're just, right. the language still makes sense because it's attached to that. So but instead of the stretch code itself, you can say 20% better than the base code, which should be aligned with the standard stretch code right. in town. Okay. But as long if the stretch code should go away, or if it gets really, really stringent or you know really crazy, then you can still okay. keep it. But sorry to be to be thick, but the stretch code is um, it's not a state created um, standard, or it is. It is. It is. It is. It is. It you, is. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't be afraid of that going away. Um, I I am a little bit. Okay, so it, it kind of is in parallel to the, the stretch code. It's just something that would be a more precise measurement to use on the stretch code. Well, if by tying it to the base code, which is a, you know statewide and but national, that's not going to go away. The you know, okay. base code is the base. IECC International Energy Code. That's going to okay. stay here. It's going to always be in a good shape in okay. Massachusetts. The stretch code, which is a Massachusetts thing, that's if the next governor hates right. it okay. and we continue to have these delays like we do now, where, where it's actually behind and people are confused, they could just say. You know what? The base energy code is getting better in six years. Let's phase it out. And not have a stretch code. I mean, one way is to say a percentage of the municipal standard, and we, regardless of what that is, because clearly mm -hmm. our incentive is to either meet or exceed whatever rating system exists at the time. Okay. So that, that we wouldn't plummet. So we'll still be ahead, most likely, in national standards and and statewide standards, and that it, it doesn't matter what it's called. Okay. It's just based on criteria, municipal criteria, 20% based on our criteria, and then we have control over what that is. Okay. So the home energy rating system of at least 25% lower than the energy code in effect in Northampton. Yeah. Yeah. Do we need to define that somewhere, or is that? It, you can refer it. It's, okay. it's part of building code, so. Okay. <coughs> and so the, um, the uh, just to clarify, can you structure ordinances 
to operate on a phased basis over time? You can phase in. You can you can do all sorts of stuff like that. You can you you can do phase ins. Mm -hmm. You can okay. and and they are living documents, so they are actually adjustable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like none of this is permanently memorialized. It's it's codified, but then it can be changed by the council. You right. can't make uh, maps change automatically. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I'm just so wondering if you know there's questions about the the longevity of the stretch code over time and you know the, the national standards changing with, with you know subsequent energy codes and every three years I mean do we want to possibly structure something so it, it meets our needs and gets in what we want but we do it over phase and it makes it possibly makes it easier to deal with the builders you know, you do something on a phase basis with these benchmarks I don't know, just right well I mean that, this out. that was what I was trying to address by attaching it to whatever the municipal standard is right because we're certainly more flexible and we have our own priorities. And um, as for phasing, phasing will be called for if the, if the introduction of this rule is the equivalent of sticker shock, if it suddenly sends, if you suddenly we get absolutely no developers who are willing to, to um, develop in the community, then we have an issue that we've got to address and then we can address that by going post facto. I think phasing it, I, I don't get, that's what we're trying to get a sense is, is this number too excessive? Because for Ryan and me, these are just numbers. That's right. and, and, and we want to know, does this actually, is this the tipping point that actually prevents anyone from considering building uh, in the community, providing housing for people who, who, are, who desire housing here in the community right. and affordable? So, and, and if, it's, if it is too excessive, then we should reduce it. If it's if it's right. if it's not, I mean, I know one builder who says he, he can't manage it, but I suspect that builder will continue building. But I, um, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, just well, kind of you know what's happening now is that build, some builders aren't building in stretch build towns, and they're staying in their towns to get away with doing you know lesser work. They're not having full door tests. They're not having any quality assurance on what they're doing, and that's unfortunate. But the market is evolving and those builders can be phased out. You know, in Western Mass, the builders who are building residential projects in downtown Northampton, mm -hmm. those the, the market for those units are gonna be at a point where they can't hit hers fifty, you know, and still make money. It's like they're doing something really wrong. You know, they're, the granite they're getting for countertop is too much money. And you know, just knowing the market here compared to other places in this in the Western Mass. You know, fifty, right. sixty five, sixty, whatever, that those are Easy, especially with a multifamily where you do gain a lot. Okay. It's easier to hit those. But does it make sense to contemplate? Like you took the average, the current average in Northampton. Yeah, I think Louis gave done? that to us. Yeah. Okay. Could that could it be done that way and say we want to beat five percent of whatever last year's average was? So you have hmm. it's sort of like a phase, but you're constantly huh. beating what you did before. It'll be hard to track. Now. Like he has my house on his records okay. as pre. So he has a, a lower perform. He has a higher, they have a higher average rating on his books than they actually do. Okay, so try Because he did it at the time I got a building permit. That yeah. logistically difficult. Yeah. But also, so I, I, I mean, for me, uh, what kind of strikes me is that you, by basing it on an unknown for the future, you're probably going to have to come back and revisit it. So in other words, if you went fit, went to 25% on the HERS rating, and the next iteration of the herd rating comes out as 50, then all of a sudden, which it might, I mean, the next stretch code might be, you know, say 50, yeah. then you'll have to look, you know, or it might come out at 40. I doubt it, but, you know, at that point, um, you, if you're concerned about cost, I would think you, at that point, you're probably gonna have to revisit it. You know, and just say, okay, have we driven this into um, an untenable area or not? Which is not to say you can't do that, you know, or maybe the stretch code next come out at 60, and you say, okay, it's fine, where it is. I think no matter what, we have to revisit it. If you make it automatic, yeah. right, where it questions it one way. Yeah. So I, I'm just, it's, the appeal I, is the default we're comfortable with. But. Okay, yeah. Now, right. well, I, I think that, I mean, I, I think that would, you, would be, with your eyes open, and then you probably have to revisit it, yes, right. I think the presumption with zoning law is that it will, it will change. Right. The, the, the purpose of zoning is to to adapt to the circumstances on the ground, the conditions of the economy, what what is sustainable. If it becomes untenable, then uh, we'd be really irresponsible. We don't address it. Um, 
I, I was hoping to never, never touch it again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> and, and one reason I brought that up also is that it based it on the current HERS rating. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of HERS ratings of, of 40 in, in Northampton. So the average might be 55, but we report it every year. And um, I've seen a number of 40s come through. So right. if all of a sudden, you know, your builders start building 40s in Northampton, then the next time you're going to have yeah, to right. be, you know, <laughs> down to 30 is going to be commandated <laughs> without you having any control over it. So it's uh, it just what, little... it, it, to, to the point of builders, I'm concerned, and I don't know, I remember we've had this conversation with Louis before about local builders who are qualified. And are we setting up a set of criteria that actually starts to exclude them or make it more difficult for them mm. to meet competitive bids from larger uh, vendors from outside of the area? Um, because that's that's kind of important too. So. There's a similar concern, it's not exactly the same. I don't think it's local versus non-local, but I think it's it may be premium builders versus right. non-premium builders. Because right. the premium guys who are local know how to do this stuff. I just don't know if the guy who builds one house a year knows how to do it. Right. Well, the, the guy builds a deck mostly, builds yeah. up decks and things like that. And yeah. Impervious services that they get fees. They emailed me something about solar, putting a sentence there about before solar. Like like Wayne mentioned, yeah. you know, you can put solar panels on a, on a roof and knock down the hers rating. How all the energy codes require the language is it's before solar. Because you want to create an efficient building before adding renewable energy. Oh, okay. So we should have some language, or otherwise someone could, okay. you know, find a loophole there. The loophole would be, I mean, they could build solar whatever. Panels, they could build a really cheap house, and right. maybe it looks really nice. Oh, that's there's all sorts of issues yeah. that wasn't um, tested or verified, and then they throw in a nice solar panel. It looks really nice, but there's it's there for five problems. Years. And yeah. It, 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 okay. uh, yeah, it leaks like a sieve, and then the panels come off after five or six years, and then you have a you have an inferior house uh -huh. with low energy rating. That's interesting. It's a workaround. I, I'm fine with that for the reasons you guys said. <coughs> I might not push the 25 percent. That I might suggest a smaller number because part of it was to give builders more choice for exactly that reason. Give them the so, option to do. Yeah. So then, so I, I mean, I understand the concept, but then I might say, well, maybe it should only be 15 percent, because then then are you pushing it for something? I'm so I, I like the idea of different. That was the whole reason for lead or hers and then hers two options. Mm -hmm. You know, but mm -hmm. well, but man, another option would be to just have more options. And so, if you had solar panels, you would have a hers rating um, of a certain amount. And if you didn't, you would right. you would mm -hmm. still need that some, perhaps a higher one. Uh, that would close that loophole. I don't know how many points you get for the solar panels, but if you think that structure would work, then. You could do that in whatever numbers you thought you could plug into it. I always like choice. I, mean, I want to get the performance level, but I like choice, so that, that works for me. And yeah, that makes sense to me, too. Because I agree with you, Wayne. I mean, it both, both you want to get the energy efficient building, for sure, but you also would be great to encourage solar work in work as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so if you said it has to be 10% better without PV panels, and it has to be whatever. I'm not sure if you guys can play with the numbers, but I can. I need to run through my meeting. Like, sorry. You guys will solve it all. All right. You taking your bike? <laughs> no, no, we're not going to approve minutes again. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I moved that no. we accept the minutes from the last meeting. Yeah, say we have three, three, three in the docket. <laughs> three? Yes, yeah, three, three, three months of meetings. Can no, I get three. recommendation to Ryan in terms of this before I leave, so you can? Uh, final recommendation. Do, do you need a final? Do you, do you just want a discussion? Or do you want a formal vote? Um, well, I don't think we have the, the answers yet. Okay. But okay. I second the minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All in favor? All three minutes? All the three minutes, the minutes from the last three meetings. Six, seven, and then uh, June, July, and August? I wasn't here for one of them. Uh -oh. uh, you weren't here for both of them. <laughs> you were here for the last, oh, you were here for the last two. two. <laughs> and Ryan, you were here for the last two. I was there for the last two. You were probably the only Bob, the only ones that were there for the last two. <laughs> and you. Well, you and right. But you trust the veracity of the minutes. I was in the wrong building at one of the meetings.
boxes, <laughs> sitting quietly by myself. One of those guys are slackers. <laughs> the L.A. That was just a police building that made you sweat, so you didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> I always get anxious when I go in the police. You'll be back. Okay, I heard an eye from Wayne as he ran out the door. Do I hear an eye from everybody else? Yeah. Hi. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, and by the way, you can accept. I found out you can accept minutes for meetings that you did not attend. Oh, um, uh, okay. You, that if you don't find any problem with them, and they sort of conform to what you understand, if someone else has an objection, basically something's represented the way they don't like them, or if they're commenting on a typo, then that's that's more appropriate. But yeah, apparently you can vote on minutes for meetings you did not attend. Hmm. Okay. Or we're in another building. <laughs> but, uh, or in okay. the future. So sorry, Ryan, for that interrupt. Not at all. But uh, um. I think there's enough ideas here to help you draft a paragraph that flushes this out a little more. From like comparing it to the base code, in or the code that's live in town at that moment, not to the stretch code, and then adding a little more language around PV option or not, and then finding what is that number. What is the ideal number? Twenty-five percent lower. Do you want to try yeah, drafting so. that right now? Probably not right now, but yeah. if you want help. Well, actually, I was like going to say you should probably work that out with Wayne. Um, how that would be best to couch the language. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, he understands what we're, we're we're trying to to get at and what we're concerned about. Because the okay. incentive is the same. The, cent yeah. the incentive and the recommendation from this committee is the same, which is to to have a more stringent standard applied to larger developments, especially since we have access to it by special permitting. That here's an opportunity to introduce okay. this. So, okay. Um, and Louis should be in on it too. Yeah, Louis should. I mean, I understand he has been. I guess that's what we're right. saying. <clears throat> but I think yeah, it should be referred to it again. But I think you reached different conclusions than uh, your commission has tonight. Um, so yeah, I would think you should be in on it. Um, and also, if we have an amendment F that I work on with Wayne that goes before the ordinance committee, I mean, an amendment can always be amended if you come up with any different numbers or something. So, um, whatever you think is best for the. Public yeah, if you, if you get the amendment, I think it'd be appropriate to send it back to us for. Okay. Just just a review. We you don't need it. I don't think you need a vote from us on that, but I think it'd be right. good if, if we have any concerns or objections that we can at least voice them okay. before it gets to the point of a vote. Now, can we comment on that via email? Like I did to you, my thoughts, but I didn't, it wasn't discussion, it wasn't Well, you have to be careful, and it actually, when that happened, when uh, it's always best in open meeting law not to hit reply all. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's uh, the reason just three of us, or? Even if it constitutes a quorum or could be considered deliberative, um, but since we're not being asked to vote on this right now, that's that's okay. But we do have to be careful in the future. All committees do that when you comment on email, you comment to the person you sent it to and not reply on. There's usually CCs all over the place. So the best way is to avoid it and to, to be clear of the law. I mean, we've been struggling with this for some time. And we talk about exceeding stretch code, we're trying to exceed open meeting law requirements, but they're more fluid than than the code, the you know, state clear. building codes. <laughs> they literally change every year. So um, so in that respect, yeah, in the future, just be, be careful about hitting your plan on. Um, you know, unless, are you planning to come to the meeting? Yes, that's okay. <laughs> but. And then bring your comments to the meeting. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I think that was, that was very helpful for me. Yeah. Um, and so, I'm and gonna, if you have further comments, just get in touch with me or Wayne. Should I assume that we should put this on next month's agenda? <coughs> when do you mean? Uh, first, uh, I'm sorry, just second, one month from now. Second, yeah, second, second Thursday. Just throw some coins in and it'll be right back. Okay. Um, well, I guess, may I get back to you on that? Sure. Depending yeah. on the schedule, as well. Absolutely. But I'd okay. certainly be happy to come back if yeah. something I mean, if lines you, up again. Yeah, if you, if you need it voted on by the commission, then gotcha. that would okay. be the best, you know, bring it okay. back next time. Great. Well, thank you. Sure. Okay. Do you want to stick around for the lighting presentation? No way. <laughs> <laughs>
Actually, I am interested, but I look forward to hearing you, about you it. The Transportation and Parking Commission. You get it twice. Absolutely. Yeah, you get, you get the he, He'll tell you all about the PowerPoint that you're going to see in TPC. So. Okay. Right. He'll give you the highlights. Okay. So okay. to speak. No bad, no pun intended. Sorry. Right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Take care. Bye -bye. See you, Ryan. Bye bye now. So now we don't have a quorum, so. Nope. We don't have a quorum. his last name. That's okay. O'Donnell, yeah. Council for Ward 3. Um, that's E L L, not A L D. No, I didn't. Yeah. I actually did E L L. Yeah, there you go. He's speeding me. About to come back. Yeah, he's speeding the meter. Yeah, I'm speeding the meter. I won't start the conversation yet. Energy and sustainability notwithstanding, we built the six family in Amherst uh, because their town said they wanted greater density downtown. And we own the land. So I mean, I, I, we just put a six unit on our own land. And what I found out is that the people of Amherst is very much not in my back and stuff. And so it wasn't the energy or anything. It was right. part of our life is the fact that they stretched the process out a year and a half. This is now going on year three, four. Well, um, the reason for that there was a massive change, a significant change in density requirements in, this, in the city, and uh, there were seven forms of the code that were changed. This being the last one, mm -hmm. uh, because of some concern of people in the two affected zoning districts, and. Um, you know, if I have to read the temperature of the conversation, he, there's objections expressed towards density, there's expressions uh, objections towards anything and everything, runoff. Uh, uh, Are you here specifically for agenda items? Uh, yeah, okay. and all, all the things you would expect. Um, and Brian has been assiduous about trying to address the, all those issues. Of, in fact, um, I need to make the, a, they object to the density request in front of requirements. Right. We're doing it's a little addition to our house and we're in the buffer originally You might get the wrong meeting. This is, this is the Energy and Sustainability and Commission. Okay, so the Conservation Commission people starts at 5. 530 perhaps. We end at 530. Uh, okay. That was I was given a notice was, uh, to come today and then I was speaking to the Conservation They might be. Let's see, so. Does anybody know if the Conservation Commission's meeting in City Hall? They usually meet up in the hearing room. Yeah, in City Hall. Oh, City Hall. Okay. okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Yep. All right. Who's the, so the second floor? Second floor? Uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes, that's actually why I did. Because <laughs> either either you were going to take part in the conversation or you were in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> um, somebody else may be arriving here. Send them. We'll send them up. Okay. Seems <laughs> cool. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the zone zone debates. Are very similar, not unique to any particular community, yeah. in community or political persuasion, but it's always territorial control and monitoring and, and concern. And while being sensitive to it, you also have to recognize what are your objectives. And the objectives of Amherst, I assume, are similar to they are here in this community, is to try and create uh, housing for a whole generation, basically, of people who can't afford to live here. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now we're aging out as baby boomers who are currently well in Scotts here in Northampton. Right. And the options for people who are in their 40s, 30s, and 20s are minimal. Right. And so you, if you're going to see development, you want to see it near services centrally located downtown mm -hmm. uh, where, where density makes sense. Right. And uh, so philosophically, a number of people agree with that, although, as I said, Density, but yeah, I don't. I don't live in a dense neighborhood, and I don't want to live in a dense. Yeah, if I wanted to, I would have. Right, I would have paid for that right. 25 years ago when I bought my house. <laughs> yeah. Okay, going on to LED lights. Um, uh, actually, I'm going to go to. The, I'm going to flip the order again a little bit, just because the last item, MAPC LED streetlight RFQ responses. Um, I, I, I just want to touch on that because really quick, and it actually will give some information for this um, uh, this discussion as well. So, uh, real quickly, the, the city has thrown their hat into the RFQ that went out in um, Metropolitan the Area Planning Commission has, has gotten responses in to basically do a performance contract for streetlights. Um, uh, uh, 
there's, I've got the proposals. If anybody wants to look at them, they've roughly ranked them. So we have the top top four proposals. I can tell you which order they're in. So if anybody wants to see them, um, they're available. Um, I've actually asked Scott uh, Silver if he'd be willing to look over the Winnie proposal once it is chosen, just because we don't have to go with this mm -hmm. if we don't want to. Um, so uh, I'm going to really very carefully look at the Winnie proposal to make sure that it's something that we want to go with. But the, um, the piece that will feed into this conversation is the Winnie proposal, um, actually the, two, the top two proposals <coughs> do specify um, um, Cobra Head lights that they would have as an option. And both of them are around 4,000K uh, in color. So that's just a, a value which will perhaps jump in on this, this conversation. So it's a, a 4,000K. Oh, OK. Yeah, so the color. Is that what that was? That's a cobra head light that Smith uses. That's that. not a cobra head. That's no. a, uh, no. Isn't that a cobra head? No, no, cobra heads are the, the your typical street lights. They kind of set out like this. Oh, oh, oh I see. OK. Right. So okay. this is like, so the NADC one is that you're talking about all of the road lighting. Got okay, not the ornamental downtown type things. It's um, all the road lighting. But if the conversation that is being spurred on by um, James's concerns is really a good conversation to have before we get to the street lighting, mm -hmm. because this is kind of a small potatoes compared to really upgrading all the street lights. So there's some issues that are going to pop out. This is a good time to actually air that in advance. Um, uh, uh, so towards that end, um, real quickly, uh, what the conversation is here on the ornamental post top upgrades, there are around 150 post top lights. There's the acorn type lights that you see around. There's these colonial type lights. There's uh, some globe lights at Forge Library that are part of this. Um, some of the lights around Jay's house. Uh, the four lights on the police department um, uh, park area <coughs> would be upgraded. And we've received a grant, um, 120 some thousand dollars, uh, based on uh, pricing that we've gotten from lighting uh, analysis, so from some lighting folks, uh, to retrofit those lights, so not replace them, but just basically put in a new bulb. Although when you talk about LEDs, they call it a light engine. They don't call it a bulb, it's a light engine. No. Mm. Terminology. So um, so this would be to put in light engines, these light engines. And two of them have been put in. Uh, the funny thing is, all three that gave us quotes on this spec'd the same light engine. They all said, this is the one that would fit. Um, uh, and, uh, one of the first ones we talked with, they put in two samples, which I've mentioned in the past, down by La Quarantina. Mm -hmm. um, there's one in a acorn, and there's one in a, what I call the colonial, it's kind of square-shaped one. But they're, they're, they're the two post-top lights that are on either side of La Quarantina, one's kind of right in front of the entrance, and one's around the corner um, a little bit. So with that, um, uh, James had heard that we were going to be upgrading to LEDs, and he has some general concerns about them uh, and wanted to talk about it, so I've met with him. Um, uh, that conversation led me to think that he really needs to have a more public, because the conversation led into making decisions that really weren't mine to make. Uh, style of lamp, um, uh, light levels of lamps, and I thought I needed a more general input. Um, since James couldn't be here, he provided this letter, and should we read this letter out loud? Uh, or should I just kind of point out some of the main points? I don't want to, well, you want to enter it into the record? Should enter it into the record, submit it for the record, but also hit the main points, I think, given the okay. time sake that... Okay, actually, um, can someone take a minute? If I'm, I took minutes for the last one, <laughs> for the last discussion, because I wasn't right, facilitating right. it. No, you never no. asked oh, anybody. Yeah. Okay. No, I didn't ask anybody. We jumped right into it, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me. <laughs> and, <laughs> okay, thanks, Abe. Yeah, Mary um, did the last minute, I think. Or okay, so I think some of the, the main points of his uh, letter here um, uh, was stand out. He's glad that we're moving towards more energy-efficient uh, LEDs. 
Um, but he does want to bring up uh, the, the main pieces are uh, shielding. Uh, he, you know, so he says, the light should go down only, not sideways or upwards, simply, re and this leads to, uh, you, you could not do this with the retrofit, with, you, with, with, a, with a retrofit. You would have to buy a new lamp. So um, simply replacing the bulbs inside the current post top light fixtures with LEDs will still result in significant glare and wasteful uplighting that ruins the darkness of this, of this night sky. So that leads to one point that my grant would not cover. That really means most likely buying a more expensive, uh, basically replacing a fixture. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, the one that was um, picked out, the, the, the light engine that was picked out for everybody, is almost 100% cut off in itself. But once you put it into a fixture, um, it'll light, the light will shine on the lens of the fixture, which will then re-radiate out mm -hmm. in different directions. And so it helps, it'll have some up glow as well. But the fixture itself was, was, was really, all the lights are aimed downward. Um, there's like two or three percent that actually can leak out above the 90 degrees um, in that. So, um, Color. <laughs> he wants the color to be as warm as possible. Uh, color temperature is measured in Kelvin, I guess. Yeah, yeah, Kelvin. K. Um, he's asking no greater than three thousand K. Um, uh, the high pressure sodiums out there are less than that. They're like twenty twenty six or something like that K. Um, uh, and the ones that we have been recommended are five K, five thousand K. Oh, I thought you were saying 4K. Okay, the or ones 4, that, K. the ones, the K. street the street lights would be 4,000K. So yeah. so the one that was stacked for us, oh, I see. Okay. for these is 5,000K. Um, and I'll go into a little bit more. This gets really complicated. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this gets so complicated so fast. And there's more or of this. 5,000K or 5KK. Right, 5KK, there we go. <laughs> This is like the 30K in there. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, okay, another one he's mentioning is blue, uh, blue, he said blue slash white. Um, it's actually more, probably more appropriate or more accurate to say blue light scatters more easily in the atmosphere. That's one reason why the sky is blue and the sun looks yellow. Hmm. Um, that, that is true, blue light scatters more. Um, and then he does talk about being detrimental impacts of uh, blue rich light on cyclic Cycadian rhythms, so our sleep cycles. Um, that one, I mean, I really wish James was here because he could rebut, but I've, I've looked that stuff up, and at the light levels we're talking about, there's not a study that I can find that says that would be that effect from these light levels. It's, every study I've seen, it, you're talking about daylight, I mean, you're talking about room lit levels at least. Um, so you're not talking about outdoor street lighting. Uh, particularly when you're talking about small little, you know, somewhat dim lights with these post tops are, they're, they're dimmer. So well, he's, he, he's referring to a number of studies that have shown that sea turtles near and that's, um, that's another one. Yeah. intensely lit communities that where mm -hmm. sea turtles breathe, not here, right. um, they're, they're, uh, they don't breathe. They go the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, in, in when they hatch and, uh, and that for breeding grounds so that they actually instead of towards the ocean they head towards so the they head towards downtown and, <laughs> yes, <right. laughs> and 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 as such by extension they presume that, that that level of influence may by extension affect human sleep rhythms and other things like that too, but that's that's a they, they have done studies on the sleep and sleep and, and actually okay I'll give you Briefly, now again, I'm not a scientist. I've done the research that I can. Um, I've actually asked James to give me quantified um, studies. I said, you know, I, I, here's what I have found. I haven't given it to him in depth. Um, so, I mean, did it go to the point where they, you know, prop your eyes open, they shine a light in your eyes for 30 minutes at a time, and then they measure this uh, melatonin level that your body has. And there's um, definite evidence that melatonin level Affects when you start getting tired, but it's not proven. So it's it's really what you're doing. They're they're measuring that blue light actually affects um, a process in the body that probably maybe affects the circadian rhythm. 
Um, but so they, they haven't really linked it to it. But that light level they put in your eye and stuff, uh, you, know, you would have to have room level, at least room level light. Uh, and if you get dimmer than that, they don't see an effect. So, um, and, uh, and I've seen some other papers that James is basing this on, and they don't quantify things. They make very general statements, very scary statements um, that aren't quantified. But when you look into the quantified, you know, actually the studies that have been done, this is an effect that does happen. Um, but it, I would be far more concerned about putting cold white lights inside your home um, uh, they do say, this is one case right here. This is probably, this is probably causing more, a higher level of lumens in my eyes right now than you will get from your, your yeah, tablet. From my tablet. So this is a bigger problem than the outdoor lights. Mm. Um, uh, this, is, this is actually a fairly significant amount of lumens right in my eyes. Um, so if you want to get to bed, don't read this week before you go to bed. <laughs> well, ultimately, uh, Chris and I were talking about this before we convened. Uh, I had originally heard, and uh, based on studies, that um, uh, cooler light, to make the distinction cooler versus warmer. You're for Conscon? Uh, I'm for uh, Planning Board. Zoning Board Appeals? Yep, you're in the right place. Okay. Yeah. Way outside? Yeah, well, you can hang out if you want to hear about a discussion about ambient lighting <laughs> and, and street lighting, but they, or or ignore us. <laughs> but the 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 fact that cooler light makes objects more identifiable and color distinctions easier. Uh, something that with high intensity yellow sodium based lights, actually you'll you wouldn't be able to tell someone wearing a red shirt from a green shirt. Um, that you and and consequently, there are studies that find that people feel actually safer in uh, a cooler light. It also seems less ambient. If you look at a sodium light, and you actually have some examples of these that are one that's unshielded, the one next to La Fiorentina, it, the ambient glow of orange is pervasive and evident. And whereas the, the cooler light seems to, at least the way we're capable of perceiving, is perceiving the objects without perceiving the ambience. Is clearly, and it actually does make people feel safer. Um, but beyond that, and, and there are some studies that support that as well. So there's we're seeing essentially a philosophical argument about the the, the value and validity of certain types of color scheming and lighting. I can just tell from my personal experience that I my bedroom window opens up 15 feet away to a, a sodium light that fills up my room. Mm. And I've grown quite used to it. My circadian <laughs> rhythms don't suit. But it really is pretty, I can read by it. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty bright. Yeah. And, and I would, wouldn't argue with James on that point if, as far as light pollution. It is not directed or shielded light, but it is, it's pretty intense. If that were a cooler light, it, wouldn't, it would be more like moonlight, mm -hmm. which actually is, is uh, less intrusive and, and feels so, so, towards that, so, so towards that, I'm going to get to his last point was brightness. He would like to see lights you know, as dim as possible. Um, and I'm sure dim is probably the wrong, wrong word. Um, uh, but he doesn't want it to be overlit. And I don't think he says it directly here, but I think he's implying that current lighting is possibly overlit. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so um, towards that point, though, uh, the light engine that was proposed would have a lumen output that is about three times less, uh, three, 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 time, yeah, three times less than the high pressure sodium lights that we have out there right now. And if we replaced the mercury vapor, it would be about the half of that. So the amount of light is less. And this is a, this is a picture of the one installed. Mm -hmm. You have it in your, in your hand out there. Um, so the, the lumen output of this one is probably, and I can't say we went out there and you know, measured it, but based on what a typical high pressure sodium of this wattage gives out, um, compared to what this is rated as, um, this one gives out about three times less lumens as this one. And yet, it's so the lighting level is going down. Um, James would actually like to see it less, even less than that. Mm. Now I'm gonna try to get right to the point. <laughs> There is so much. This is this is this is an incredibly complicated 
Um, uh, it's, I've done a, a, a bunch of reading on it. So the light level, the color, and the style of lamp, I think are the three things to kind of aim for right now. <coughs> Uh, if we were to um, put in new light engines and not replace the lamps, as I said, the one that was specified for us uh, would have a lumen output of about 4,500. Um, it would have a color rendition of around 5,000K, and it would be 51 watts. Um, rated at 55, but they, um, oh, one more thing I should throw out there. The Design Light Consortium, if we want to get a rebate for this, the light has to be on the Design Light Consortium qualified product list. So that's, uh, and that's where I'm doing a lot of my research is I'm going to that, that list there. This, the lamp, uh, that light engine, there is actually a 4000K version, a 4000 uh, color, uh, you know, a warmer color version of that light. Um, but unfortunately, it has been delisted from the QPL. And it would have 51 watts, and it would only produce 2,600 lumens. So as soon as you go to a warmer light, you start getting you often, not necessarily all the time, but you very often, more often than not, you get a less efficient light. And you need to either be put up with lower, light, lower lumen output, or you have to increase your wattage. And since this, our grant is based on a, um, uh, in, getting a certain savings, I can't increase the watch, nor would I want to. Um, so they took it off the list because it puts I out less lumens? Don't know why they took it off the list. I don't know why. It, but it does put out less lumens per watt. Well, in this right. case, we might want those less lumens. But we might. From an energy so. efficiency cool. standpoint, it might not. We, we might, right. In yeah. fact, I, I agree, we might. So, so that was taken out. In his handout, James does suggest an alternative. That looks an awful lot like the one that was suggested. And this, this is on the um, uh, Design Light Consortium list. So you can see, this actually is a pretty decent picture. You can see all the LEDs are lined up in the bottom here. So they're shining just straight down. 20% more efficient. Um, or less watts. Yeah, for what he doesn't, what James forgets, fails to put down there is that it's only 2,600 units. <laughs> so, like the other one, uh, so this one is uh, 3,000K, so it's actually even warmer, um, uh, but it's much less lumens um, uh, than the other ones. Um, so it's about 42% it's about less light. Something else that has been quite interesting for me is that I started researching, well, how much light does a typical high pressure sodium put out? How much light does a typical metal halide put out? I started looking at the lights that we have installed. And I've come to the conclusion that um, replacing them all with the same lamp is probably not a good idea. Because, okay, I'm, you're not going to see the details here, but the lumen output ranges from up here to down here. So this light right here, I actually think I'd probably be like about like this in uh, Pulaski Park. It really, it, this light would give out an effect of light that's probably somewhat equivalent to what we have in Pulaski Park. The lights around James' house right now, Forbes Library, they're they're replacing ones. So so that, that's one where you know there actually is kind of a, a possible it would meet James's desires and it would probably provide us a, a nice amount of light. And it would even save us more energy than what we were planning on, because it drops it down. Um, so, Chris, yeah. I mean, you and I talked about this extensively in the office. You know, James's focus, and you know, God bless him for being dedicated about this. Right. Um, but you know, if, if we look at the NESC as far as you know, what what are we supposed to be doing here? Yeah. This needs to be done in sort of a sequential, systematic way. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're not just going to start replacing street lights with LED lamps without taking a look at do we need that street light at the corner of Masonic and Main? Well, this, this is the order. Right now, I'm just okay. talking about the ornamental post house. Okay, so we'll so yeah. talk about the ornamentals, yeah. which are yeah. clustered just, downtown. Yeah, just the ornamental. Um, we're going to need some sort of a systematic look at 
you know, recommended standards for 2014 as far as lighting in a core downtown versus lighting in a peripheral neighborhood, let's say out on 66. Um, before, you know, because I know you know if we've got the MS, what is it, the MA, MSPC grant. No, this is this is that. I'm sorry, I don't want to confuse them. That's okay. that's for the street lights. So right. that's that might be coming down, and that'll probably have a whole engineering option until we can you know, do engineering. Okay. This is basically taking a product that three lighting uh, folks, two of them being pro program expediters. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Utilities would like to help fund this. Um, and they all recommended the same lamp um, pretty much throughout. Uh, let me just go on to two more right. two more pieces here. This, this, um, uh, so the one that he does, so if we were to use this in the other areas, which would be Amory Street lights along the bikeway, bike path, um, um, where are some of the other? Strong Avenue. So the yeah, Strong is, Pearl, Strong Pearl, Pearl, Pearl um, uh, Hampton Avenue bike path, uh, the uh, Union Station lot. Um, you know these kind of areas. If we were to use them in those lights, then we could only do so not understanding that we were going to drop the light level that, that's there, and it would effectively drop the light level. So. And that, that might not be an energy commission's value either. I mean, that's the reason that I did not do that myself, was I said, you know, I, as a, a city staff here replacing bulbs, I can't just go around and start putting them in dim bulbs, you know, lower bulbs. <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not going to fly. No. So we got plenty of dim bulbs already. Exactly. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Fine. Okay. <laughs> Chris, can I ask you a question about sure. the graph you put up? You said yes. you looked at the existing bulbs. Is that just of the ornamentals? So the yes. So how come these utility contractors all expect the same bulb where it's clear we good question. have a variety? Good it sounds like good question. You know, having worked with utilities and changing light bulbs, they don't often always pick the best thing on the market. It's just kind of like here's something we know we like. There's a lot of them in stock. Right. Stamp. Right. Right. So so two of them were program expeditors. The third one was a totally independent mm -hmm. lighting contractor that doesn't work with utilities. Expect the same one. But they didn't ask how to use that space. What's there now? I mean, Which is what you've got to ask. They all looked yeah. around. They all, they all, they all walked around town, downtown. They all looked at the lights before they gave me a, a spec. So, um, but that same question jumped out to me too, particularly when I saw, you know, some of the low, low lumens in some of them. And mm -hmm. quite frankly, I, I think Pulaski Park probably had much higher lighting at one time, and someone probably did start putting in. I mean, they've got 42 watt contact fluorescence in there. <laughs> so, um, we're not getting any energy savings no. from them. You know? So, going to a 41 watt one, that actually makes a lot of sense that we're going to get someone to pay for it. If we don't go this, if we don't do this, then we talk about replacing the, um, the fixture itself. And there's a couple of reasons why that might not be a bad way to consider. Number one, if you do put a retrofit in, LEDs have a shorter life if they get too hot. The, the light engine is going to go into a, a lamp that's uh, a fixture that's unspecified. It hasn't been tested with that fixture. There's a bit of a chance, and we decided to take this chance, that we might not get the full lifespan out of it. Um, we thought, you know, these things are kind of leaky. They you know, look to me like they have <laughs> the airflow. We can always drill a couple holes in the bottom if we want to do and let more air flow through. Um, uh, and because, quite frankly, it's a grant, to, you know, we decided to go with it. But if you really want to have something that's got a warranty that's going to last for a long time and you're going to rely on it, then you really are talking about a new fixture. So maybe it's worth going to a new fixture. Um, it probably would cost more. Um, uh, second is uh, a lot of what I call the acorn ones are really kind of crappy. They're old and they've been, when they've been breaking, uh, the parking department has been replacing them with a different style, um, much cheaper, different style. Uh, so, um, you know, putting in a new light, it's not like you're trying to hold on to a really high quality thing. It's, it's already kind of gone. Um, uh, but if you get to the new lights, 
And James does suggest a plus couple here. Um, you start talking about different styles. Like when you get to LEDs, you get something like this. That doesn't even have a lens. There's no glass in there. Um, right. So you just basically get a downlight. Um, this one that he pointed out, unfortunately, is not on the qualified product list. So this is one we could not buy. Um, or we could buy it, but we wouldn't get a rebate for it. Um, is there something similar? On the what I have done list? is I have looked at all of them that are on the qualified product list, and I handed these out, and I've taken one page of so you, you, you'll see in there, you'll see the, um, the type. There's, there's an example. So you can see what they look like. Model 6 and. Right. And the Model 6 and Model 7, etc. that refers to the table, which shows their performance and stuff that's on the front page. So model 10 looks the closest to what James has got represented there. Which actually has sort of domed. Actually, I think Model 3 does, first of all. Three. Yeah, if you look at Model 3. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Along the bottom. Yeah. Yep. yeah. It looks so modern, futuristic. They do. That's that's the thing is that the reason for the acorns is sort of self-referential for a, you know a community that tries to present yes. antiquity and so on and so forth. Right. Try to replicate old gas lamps old type of thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And well, somebody, somebody's have that. So, some do. Number three does. Model ten. Number two is. Number two is, a, is attempting to do a direct replacement. Yeah. I mean, I think if you go too far, I like referencing. I don't like trying to copy it. I don't think it's always silly. I think looking at chandeliers with bulbs that are supposed to look like flames, right. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, who's, who's being right. fooled here? Yeah. But at the same time, there is something that sort of rhymes with at least the sense of, uh, of an antiquity. Number six clearly looks like it was designed for uh, San Jose, right? It's not, it's, Called a Mesa LED. Uh -huh. I mean, in that that wouldn't fit here because we right. don't have new structures downtown. Right. So that so that leads to the second thing that I one of the, the other reason why I went with just replacing the bulb with the light engine was I didn't really want to open up this whole conversation right. of you know where does where how, how how much time and effort is it going to be to figure out what is an acceptable new lab to put in there because. If you're going to go this way and trying to get the efficiency and trying to go more futuristic with the LEDs, you're going to have a style change. I mean, this one right here, which looks the closest to it, um, it's a dim, it's, it's not a high power right. light. So it probably would, I mean, maybe it would work. Look at 10. Also, I mean, the first thing I think of is, you know, this is all new. It's, it's pretty trendy technology. technology. Right. Yeah. Um, how long has it been out and available on the market? How has it been tested? You okay. start getting into lens-free lamps yep. in New England with the elements. Um, you know, I want to know if these are going to last. Yeah. Okay. So towards that, one of the reasons why the utilities and one of the reasons why the Design Light Consortium's qualified product list exists is because. Um, when people started putting in LEDs and looking at when the LEDs came out, people started realizing the thing says equivalent to 60 watts and it looks more like a 40 watt bulb to me. It doesn't have the lumens that it says. Um, uh, it's supposed to last so many hours but it burns out after a certain amount of time because it doesn't have good heat management. And, uh, and so the Design Light Consortium started testing these and when they, so they test them for actual lumen output um, and then they, they test them for life, uh, for life. Now, you know, does it meet the elements? I'm not sure if they test for that. But um, if you're buying an LED, you really, quite frankly, even if you buy it at home, you probably want to make sure it's on this qualified product list. Because it means someone has really put it through its paces. It's, you're going to get what it says you're going to get, and it's probably going to last for you. What's um, the warranty? Seven years on some of these, it says. On a product defect. Yeah, a lot of them will be. The last seven years, yes. in a, you know, New England environment with ice storms in the winter. <laughs> and yeah, I can see that. Well, with no lens, yeah. I mean, it's the lights are are just up. They're solid state. Yeah. You know, it's they're solid state 
things. Everything else can be sealed up in here. They, you know, all the fixtures, all the electronics are sealed up in top. All you're doing is you're just not providing a, a lens to, to glare it. But these bulbs are made to last 25, 35 years, right? And they say, I would easy to pass on to your kids. Yes, yeah, 70, well, how many times? Um, no, they're, they're, these are on all the time. Oh, yeah. like, right. they're, they're a certain amount of hours. And for these, it would be on, you know, a number of hours each night. But if so. there's no warranty at all for putting in existing picture during the retrofit, mm -hmm. and then maybe there's some failure, you know? Right. Plus so those pictures, those, yeah. yeah, those pictures probably, you know, how many more years before they start rusting or whatever, compared to putting in new new ones where you at least know you got seven years. Right. Right. So that's kind of my dilemma. Well, but that also, and, you know, James, the, the, the philosophical, I mean, James is, wants a dark sky initiative, wants less light leakage, leakage particularly up. Mm -hmm. He also seems to, and he has expressed a concern about how the light presents below. But that, once you get below that shielded area, that's the area that should be of our particular concern. We are concerned about light leakage and anything that we can do to guarantee that light casts down and doesn't float out, the better. But the fact is, is that when you, the other elements come into play, it's why do you have ornamental lighting? So they're principally for safety and to present also a sense of security for the people who are congregating downtown. And um, so in that respect, our criteria change a little from his criteria, which yeah. is his, 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 at that point, becomes a kind of an aesthetic, and he's saying a health issue as well, or he's, he's suggesting a health issue that we haven't really been able to qualify. So more importantly, one of the things, we're trying to find the optimal system energy-wise, and also the reason that we have lights in the downtown area that provides that sense of security and provides that coverage that that the public will demand. I mean, I know that when we converted the Armory Street lot, there was a, a lot of concern expressed because people suddenly, it was a change, and they felt that it was darker and less safe. Uh, oh, the LEDs, when, the yeah, when, yeah, when, when they first came, they, they were they, people, Yeah, okay. and they, they, people were concerned that it's okay. darker, but then they started to feel safer. Um, <laughs> then everyone started to become used to it and, it, and and now no one, I defy you to find someone who could tell you the difference between the lights now and 10 years ago in the Armour Street lot, and I don't think they'd be able to. But, but our concern is to uh, provide light that does what light, what people want light to do. Right. And that is to be able to get their keys in their car, to be able to uh, identify someone nearby so they don't seem suspicious. Go along a sidewalk without tripping over a Exactly, right. and, and to prevent liability issues like that. And, and, and just to make a, a generally inviting downtown for people because we have a lot of commerce during the nighttime. At the same time, we don't want to cast, we don't want to waste the energy lighting up a night sky that does no one any good. And we don't want to waste energy even casting down, but at the same time, we still want to provide the sense of, uh, of an ambient sense of security, which, and there are studies relevant to that. And it sounds like it, essentially, that's the struggle you're having because a lot of the criteria that, that are being presented probably take those into consideration to, to make it put, qualify for proper lighting systems. And, and I think all things being equal, we might not meet James's thresholds, but we are certainly a whole lot closer, what we're discussing, a whole lot closer than what exists today. Yes. And, and e I, even if we did the retrofit. Yeah. We just did the simple retrofits, but and then and if we replace units too, then we have better. something better and more robust, right. perhaps. So. so speaking of that, you know, why we do things. I know that Bill Attender told me um, on this chart here, the um, the ones that are really tall, these are the metal halides. Yeah, and, those are. And and then part of that is just because metal halides. Um, they, uh, they have some of the, and, uh, and we'll the metal halides are the biggest, uh, had the biggest lumen output, and a lot of them, there's a, like a bunch of them in the roundhouse area. I know Bill Attender told me that he had women coming up saying they wouldn't park there because they didn't feel safe with those high pressure sodiums. So he put in a higher, you know, a pretty strong output metal halide in order to make them feel safer. Uh, so it's a whiter light. Um, and uh, and it's a pretty strong light too. Um, 
Uh, so the one that we were proposing putting in probably would make those look a little dimmer. They would still maintain a nice, you know, uh, uh, an easier to distinguish light, but it would probably dim those lights a little bit, is the one that was recommended. So the parking down there, is that going to be redeveloped to Pulaski yeah, Park? Yeah, and I was just going to say, I mean, Pulaski Park, when it's all said and done, will now open up. That parking lot will actually be more... Is that kind of actually happen? Approachable. Yeah. Yeah, Probably. I believe so. Okay. I have every confidence that it will. When? Uh, <laughs> they probably breaking ground... We were talking about, you were talking about the spring? That's what I heard. Yeah. yeah. So, but this, yeah. Gr this grant, um, uh, I have to have it finished within two years. Um, if we don't finish it in a year, we won't be eligible to apply for the next year's grants. Uh, so it's like I'd like to spend it, but that kind of only leads me to believe that some of those money that and for the last few parts right. really be aimed for paying for better, right. put towards better laps. Uh, instead of putting I mean, what's being yeah. proposed actually makes it far less daunting as a parking lot, a parking system yeah. as. You're not running up against a cliff, which is part of the thing that creates a sense of dread, and it's dark and remote, and there's no, it'll be more involved, and and that informs. The, you're absolutely right. That informs. If we don't need bright metal halide. In fact, actually, it's metal halide lights not particularly thoughtful to people who live in the South Street apartments because it's. I mean, it's it's like it's like staring at an oncoming headlight from a Porsche and, and, and with a halogen bulb in it. So. And that's, and that's another point for actually re replacing the, the lamp fixtures. Right. So they now come with what they call these, these bug rating. Brightness, uplight, and glare. And so you can, you know, find a style that really has low glare. Do they call mosquitoes? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> B, U, and G. It's a B rating, a U rating. Actually, most of our co-brands are all filled with dead bugs. And the DPWs sure. that come out. Right. You can always look up at night and see the collection of the comic-con right. so bugs. Or something. Yeah. So we have two minutes left. Um, where do I go with this? Um, I mean, maybe we, I, I, unfortunately this is a long conversation. But as far as, I, I mean, it may not even be the Energy Commission's um, uh, decision to talk about style of light <laughs> or if we are to replace lamps with new lamps, I'm assuming it's going to cost more. Uh, it's not easy to get money. I mean, it's not easy to get quotes. You'd rather have a style picked out and then find out what the price is for that um, than finding out prices for a whole bunch of styles. I, I, I think our charge is not aesthetics. No, that's that's someone either. else's. That'll be Carolyn's job. And but the the uh, <laughs> uh, uh, aesthetics, yeah. but more importantly, the the best value per dollar and lowest energy reduction. And to that end, it sounds like you're actually headed in the right direction, at least as far as I'm concerned with this. If it costs more money, where does that money come from? Well, there, that's also your job, too. <laughs> 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 Not necessarily. I, you know, I know. I, 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 the bottom, what was the bottom? Yeah. Right. It depends what that is. It could be how much capital project. I mean, it could be capital yeah. and grants. That's what we've talked about. First. Right, okay. How how we structure this, but I agree with Bill that our charge is not the technology per se, but the efficiency and the lamp or the item that's going to most closely meet mm -hmm. what we're trying to accomplish citywide. So would it be appropriate to take the energy savings that we'll get, and this will drop the energy use? Um, uh, for these ornamental lights by on the order of 70-75%. So I, I, I recall it's something like a, oh geez, don't quote me, $12,000 a year savings. So is it appropriate to take that money, match that um, over a number of years with the, the grant money, and actually go for you know, a, uh, replacing lamp fixtures themselves instead of just I would say so. Not including the areas that are Prime for redevelopment. Yeah, that's. It's gotten to be clear that we, a one size fit all is not really a good idea. So now I'll put more thought into that. Just you know, I mean, as far as thematically, that's a style thing that one size fits all type thing. So that you have a uh, thematically, and again, that's not our bailiwick. But the um, I, you're I right. There's variables on energy, on efficiencies, and types of light delivered, and in the circumstances, and they should be adjusted for circumstance. 
lights in Pulaski Park versus lights down on Armory Street should be vastly different than right. right. So, right. And, and to that extent, yeah, so those variables should exist. And then we'll leave it up to someone else, although I think that thematically the lights should all pretty right. much look the same. But if the stadiums are that big, it's worth picking two or three models that look historically congruent with what's there now and say, give us bids and look at the payback. Yeah, okay, could be. And if, uh, is that a city council decision? If the savings that we get? No. Uh, as far as transfer funds or allocation yeah. of funds, yes, that's a, that comes under a financial order for the city council. That's right, because you would have yeah. to pay the money up front right. and then earn it back right. by savings over right. time. So, um, well, we're out of time. So, I move that we adjourn. We'll take it, I'll take it from there. <laughs> And uh, you can go to the Parking and Transportation Commission meeting for a follow-up. Completely repeat on your situation. <laughs> wow.